Welcome to How Not to DM. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me on my quest to interview the very best dungeon masters on this plane of existence. Here's a quick word from our sponsors. From frozen tundras to vast deserts to uncharted jungle islands, follow the clues to the Tomb of Hagamoth. Dire Destiny Books presents a classic adventure in a new expanded format with five unique dungeons, dozens of memorable NPCs, and a host of new foes, magic items, spells, and player options. Available now on DM's Guild from Dire Destiny Books, and the adventure continues at DireDestiny.com. Hey online D&D players, tired of cumbersome anonymous character sheets or hefty subscription fees? Dwarven Academy solves that for you. Dwarven Academy is an intuitive and eye-pleasing character builder for D&D 5e devised to help all players easily navigate the game's complex rule system. Best of all, it's free. Head to dwarven.academy to build your next character and follow them on Twitter, Discord, and Patreon. Now let's get to our guest intro. This episode's guest is B. Dave Walters. If he isn't your favorite member of TTRPG royalty, look up your favorite player or DM and you'll see that they've probably played together at some point. B. Dave has played on, GM'd, produced, and designed games for some of the most popular TTRPG streams to date. Needless to say, his advice and experience are worth their weight in gold coins. Enjoy! Dave Walters, I say words about things. You can find me all over the interwebs, wherever fine streaming content can be located. I've been playing games since I was 13. Uh, my first introduction was to Rifts, shortly, which is a game that that does not age well because the power creep is out of this world. And when I was playing it, a friend of mine who was the same age was like, no, if you're going to play, you got to play D&D because he very much was like the hipster purist. Um and got into D and D soon after, and then the the whole world of darkness hit. I was the prime demographic for that. Vampire and werewolf just fell right on my face. I was a ground zero for all of that. And over the years, even as as life you know went where it went, and started working, and and found other hobbies and pastimes, I, I just never lost my love of gaming. And then around three years ago through uh, an odd set of circumstances, realized that this was a thing that I could do for money, then a thing I could do well for money, then a thing I could do well at a high level for money, and then we're pretty much here. <laughs> I yeah. never thought of D&D as the vinyl of TTRPGs, but that's kind of how your friend made it sound. I mean, the, the, there are those dudes, man. There are those, <laughs> like, there are those dudes. There, there's people that still swear by second edition, and I'm like, shine on, you crazy diamonds. I don't have to calculate that go ever again in my life, but okay, great, <laughs> sure. Love yeah. the Floyd reference. Yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's funny. So you started at a pretty young age. Uh, do you remember your first experience running game, you know, and, and how it went? So, you know, this is funny because somebody asked me this recently and I have no clue when I ran my first game. I vividly remember playing my first game. I have no Mm -hmm. recollection whatsoever of running my first one. What I'm pretty sure happened was my buddy and I, the same one that got me into D&D, we would kind of alternate for each other and just play kind of one-on-one, which is why I did one-on-one shots, the show I did kind of midway through the pandemic to help everybody maintain their sanity Uh, (laughs) i was already very comfortable just playing with one person and i think we kind of alternated i very clearly remember my first character was an elven fighter mage thief that was based on vampire hunter d big fancy hat long sword you know and yeah i I, i'm 99 percent sure we alternated because my my first very clear memories of like long for camp long form campaigns were 10 years plus in and i'm like i was not just a player for 10 years so somewhere in there i must have been doing it yeah do you remember this is kind of like the shtick of the show right how not to Mm -hmm. dm do you remember Mm -hmm. any particularly bad errors or mistakes you have made in your career of running games and kind of what lessons that you can give to other people so they don't make those same mistakes the worst mistake you can make is one of the most common which is believing that you as DM are novelist, that you are telling a story to the people at the table. You are Mm -hmm. not. You are co-creating a story together. 
uh, you were helping orchestrate this, but everyone is telling the story. And you can tell the difference of people that don't understand this because they'll say things like way too much narration. And you know when people are talking and talking and talking and talking, and it's like we'd like to do some things also, especially when, <laughs> or when they um they tell you what happens to your character. They just tell you, you know, no dice, no nothing. And I don't mean dramatically, like you know, the arrow arcs out of the shadows and hits somebody in the chest because narratively it needs to. I mean, they're making decisions for the people at the table, which is unilaterally bad. So don't do that. And I'm I'm sure I'm certain. I did it at the beginning too. And in and, and a symptom of this, and you kind of will know, uh, is there there is a harmless version of this and a fairly insidious version of this, which is over preparing because the desire to just not make a mistake and just be ready is of course noble and great. But when it becomes micromanagement, it's bad. When you know you have the the walls of the castle lined out on a stack of graph paper, you know, and you have this this four hour encounter plan, and the first thing they want to do is leave the castle, which, for the record, is going to happen. The players are like cats; you buy them the most expensive toys, they want to sit in the box. Like this is just the way <laughs> of things. But when you try and force them back into the castle, like I, I will never forget, I had a guy who was the most railroady person I ever played with, and I hated it constantly. And we were actually playing uh, a Pathfinder module, um, Skull and Shackle, which, you know, the beginning of Skull and Shackle is you go to a town that is a bunch of pirate ships lashed together. That's the town. And we were looking for the main bad guy for whatever reason, you know, inciting incident type thing. And I was playing a character who was very much patterned on Rorschach off of Watchmen. She was an inquisitor. She was black and white. There is right and wrong. You know, like, I mean, and there, there's guilt and there's innocence and the guilty must be punished. That was this character. So we're trying to figure out what's going on. We can't figure it out. Of course, you know, there's no, no clues, no hints. We can't roll for anything. We're just stuck spinning our wheels. And finally, I go to the bartender and I say, take me to your boss right now or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah and he's like well but we have security and i'm like question you got to ask yourself is can the guard get to me before i get to you take us to the guy and he's like roll a bluff check i was like i am not bluffing i'm going to count to three and i'm going to kill this man <laughs> one <laughs> two and he very much like, but i'm like i'm i'm prepared for all of us to die right now in this bar and finally he's like okay 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 you know but but Stuff like that all the time would, would come up. And I'm just like, Ugh, yeah, don't be railroady. It's a funny power trip that some people have, right? They're like, I'm more clever than you because you can't figure out how to play my game. And it's just a bad look. Yeah, right. It's the well, one. It's a, it's a couple of things. One is far more likely that your your encounter is not designed nearly as cleverly as you think. But two, like I do a lot of escape rooms, or I guess in, in the before times when we could be together, I did a lot of escape rooms. Yeah. And, and one of the things that you learn very quickly is when you're confronted with these puzzles, you're probably going to get it in about 30 to 90 seconds or not at all. And so that's what we do. We just descend on this place and you find a thing and you do what you think would work. And if it doesn't work, you're like, okay, switch with me. You know, because I'll spend the next hour here because your brain will lock on what you think it is even if there is another answer. And unless you have some sort of outside assistance, you will just get stuck there. And that's not fun. You can have done everything right and had the most ingenious puzzle. But if you got people that puzzles aren't their jam, and I, I mean, I'm not a puzzle person, you know? My friend Deborah Ann Wall is a supreme puzzle person. Like she handmade all those puzzles for relics and rarities. And I'm all like, you do you, girl. Now, I'm not that person. You know, the the more, you know, drama and dialogue and things like that are, are more my thing. You know what I mean? Raising the stakes of encounters and high stakes experiences. You know, that's my thing. But, you know, it, it, to, to each their own. So, you know, the, you got to make sure that the story that you're trying to tell is a fit for the people that are at your table. And, and of course, like like any well done meal. There should be all of that. You know, there's an appetizer and a main course and dessert, you know, especially if, you know, that's what your players are looking for. Give the fighty people a chance to be fighty. Give the talky people a chance to be talky. Give the thinky people a chance to be thinky. Give the sneaky people a chance to sneak. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that was the, the best advice I'd heard about designing encounters in combat was to try to give everyone something to do. 
yep. and it it totally changes the landscape of your game. So talking about some of the games that you've run or games that you've played in, what is your favorite memory of improv or role playing? Something you just had to totally make up on the spot to make it work. And it just turned out to be so memorable and legendary. My two fondest memories, believe it or not, are times that the players were able to trick me. But that might be a different different question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'd love I'm, to hear those too. Well, I'm 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 pretty hard to trip up. One, I was surprised and betrayed by the dice as they are wont to do, and once I was surprised and betrayed by the people as they are wont to do. But but to and, and I will tell you those things. But but to answer this question, so at the height of my Patreon, I was running about thirty five to forty games a month. I've <laughs> run over. 500 almost 600 sessions of vampire v5 i've run more games of v5 than anyone else alive so i know that game i think some of the most touching moments were over time i saw actual changes in the humans that were playing those characters as Mm. they were exploring different concepts and situations in the world of darkness lends itself to that very easily because it's this world it's you know the, the the shop on the corner is really there you know the mall is the mall so the barrier of immersion is a little lower than, say, a D&D, where you need to learn what Waterdeep is, why that matters. Also, I'm an orc. Also, I'm a paladin. You know, being like, I'm a normal person that just happens to be a monster now. It's a little easier, you know, mask to put on. I would see things like shy people, shy humans that started playing shy characters became more outgoing humans because their characters became more outgoing is they felt safer to kind of open up and blossom and take more risks it actually changed them and who they are in some of those moments of interactions like i remember one in particular I make a point that unless somebody tells me overtly it's important to their story that they have bad parents, I always make parents great because Mm -hmm. not a lot of people have had that in life. So unless you tell me my dad's an asshole, parents are loving and supportive when you encounter them, you know, or at least even if they're adversarial, they mean well, you know, like they're, 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 they're working to your benefit. And uh, we were playing a game and and they were jumping through time for some reason. And there was one character whose dad had been a doomsday prepper and was dead, but they needed to know something dad knew. So they went back in time through, you know, MacGuffin medium or whatever to go and ask dad, essentially, where was this thing buried or whatever? Yeah. So they're talking to dad. And at the end, he just says like, hey, son, I'm really proud of you and, and hug the person. And then that was just sort of the end of the scenario. And the person messaged me afterwards saying how much it meant to them that their dad had said they were proud of them because their real dad never had and a hundred stories like that things so things like that would would be my my favorite improv moments the two times in which i was befuddled by them was (laughs) this same group of people i had one character who was named uh, Sage Wreath. I had a group of intro in Vampire, which is the business vampires. If you watch LA by Night, that's the, the clan I play. It's my favorite, the clan of kings. And I had one character in particular that I was like, I need a vampire that the werewolves need to be afraid of. Because all things being equal, a, a werewolf runs over a vampire. Like, it's not even close. So I basically based him on Gaston, more or less, a slightly more subtle Gaston, but he was a Ventru big game hunter, and he hunted werewolves because that was the greatest sport. And I successfully made him awful. Like, he'd just done terrible things for months, and they couldn't figure out how to stop him. And they knew that it was all leading to this, uh, to a head where they finally had to face him. And they set a trap for him. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm playing all into it. And again, for another reason, they had access essentially to a wish, but one wish. And the way I, I did wishes in that are the way that like way back old school D&D, wishes could do literally anything. But it was the Twilight Zone monkey paw thing that it would do exactly what you asked for. And so the DM would grant it, but you twisted it and made it weird. You know what I mean? It very yeah. much was like, I wish for eternal life, but you didn't wish for eternal youth. You know, that kind of like, it's very much (laughs) that. And they all knew that was my aesthetic. So apparently they had worked together behind the scenes for a month and a half to word the wish in such a way that I couldn't get out of it. 
So I have, you know, my terrible person come to like truly mess up these werewolves. Like I'd made it in my mind. I was fully content to kill some of them because I'm like, this is an epic encounter. Like, I mean, we've been building to this. They are not all coming home. He is going to kill some of them. And they dropped their wish on me and it was so carefully worded and they got a bunch of still shots of me. I realize you guys can't see me, but they have, they took <laughs> screenshots of me just being like, you know, just, just my, my just thinking face. I'm like, there's, just, there's, there's a way I can, I can, I can twist this to their credit. They done it. They done it. And long story short, the actual effect was they took his powers away. It, it was worded very carefully, but they took his powers away. And when they took his powers away, of course, they ran over him. Literally, they ran over him. They had a dump truck full of explosives that they crashed into him and blew up. So that was <laughs> how they killed him. The, the, the other thing was, that was when the players got me. And again, I'm very difficult to trick. The other one was the game of Pathfinder, where we started at level one. And the character's concept is he's like, I want to be a dragon slayer. It's like, well, you're level one. You ain't slaying no dragons. But okay, you know, but yeah. that was his jam. I am a dragon slayer. You know, this is just the beginning of my story. And I very early in the game gave him an arrow of slang shot, which if you're not familiar with it, it basically you have to shoot. It will it, it it's it's set to something. So it'll be like uh, you know, an arrow of slang shot for dragons or arrow slang shot for giants or whatever. So it's not just like I can kill anything, it's like I can kill a specific thing. And when you shoot them, they have the save against it is very low. So if you hit them, you will kill them, but the save to beat it is very low. So it's highly unlikely this, this item will work. So I gave him this arrow slang shot and probably six months later I had this encounter plan where this dragon was going to attack the town. And I had it all mapped out round by round by round. Like round one is going to come in and breath weapon, you know, fly away. And then you'll have a, a round. And then round two is going to come back, but it's going to land and fight for a minute and leave again. Like I, I very much had it worked out. This whole big thing, dragon's coming in, roll initiative, he goes first. It's like, I'm going to shoot it with my arrow slang shot. And I'm like, you're what now? And he's like, yeah, my arrow slang shot. And I'm like, oh, I mean, well, that's not going to work. He rolls natural 20 direct hit i rolled the save one and with the dragon it would save on basically any roll right literally literally the other 19 faces on the die it would have been fine <laughs> but that's the one house rule i play with one always fails and a 20 always succeeds even on skill checks there's always a chance you know you're, you're never so outmatched you can't pull a hail mary you're never so confident you can't fumble it's there's always a chance so all this build up and planning Round one, minute one, attack one, shoots the thing out of the sky. And of course, he's like, ah, yay! And of course, you know, they all go crazy, <laughs> which, which is what the game is about. You know, I very easily could have been like, oh, he saves, because I had the DM screen. You know, I very easily could have been like, well, the second dragon comes in. But that's, that's not what the game is about. The game is about that huzzah moment that he and all of them still remember, you know? What a payoff for saving a magic item, man. You know what? That same dude, this campaign went on about four, four years. He did the same thing to me again, where he had a thing that he'd sat on for like 18 months. They essentially had uh, an emergency teleport. They, they had a single use plane shift or something, you know, but yeah. they used like, if you get into it, because uh, God gave it to them. It was like, you get into trouble, pull this string, you know, I will bring you home. And he sat on that for about a year and a half. And same thing. I had this huge encounter planned. Uh, they were facing Baphomet. And the first thing Baphomet was going to do was split into six. So they all had to 1v1 Baphomet. Which again, I was like, some of you are about to die. Let's go. And he was like, uh, use the evac. I'm like, huh? <laughs> He's like, you know, the, the thing we got, you know, 18 months ago. Yeah, I, I do that. We leave. It is like, okay, you know, <laughs> I guess it's like that gif, I guess, you know, like that's what it was. You got to just be ready for anything as a DM. And, and I'm glad that you gave them those, those experiences. Cause like you said, it could be easy to be like, well, you know, the dragon actually saved or well, you know, you know, try to yeah. rules lawyer it away or whatever, but you're right. That's exactly what the game's about. 
So you've talked a lot about using dilemmas in your games, especially for Mm -hmm. higher level parties to challenge them because it can be hard to challenge a party over 14th Mm -hmm. level in D&D or or whatever else. So what's your framework for a good dilemma and why do you enjoy using them so much? Yeah, level 20 is very much my niche because, again, that's what I like in stories. I like stakes. I like... You know, the fate of the free world hinges on what we do. Uh, You can tell a very intimate and compelling story where, you know, the fate of the neighborhood or the house or, you know, you you can still tell a gripping story that is small. I just like large scale. You know, if we don't stop the Death Star, everyone is dead. And then everyone on lots of planets are dead. That's my thing. And one of the things I learned very early uh, from D&D Beyond Fewer than 5% of campaigns have level 20 characters in them. Not just play from level 1 to 20, just have level 20 characters, period. Because I realize a lot of people kind of think it's like frightening and overwhelming that the game kind of ends at level 20. Mm -hmm. And I had two advantages in that I played a lot of MMO, a lot of WoW, was there from day one on WoW. Uh, and played a lot of games before that where, you know, the in-game content you can't even access till your max level. And two, I have a a lot of training in the martial arts where a lot of people think when you earn a black belt, you're done. But what a black belt actually means is you've begun. Like you understand the basics enough to actually learn the style. So it was very easy for me to understand that it's like, well, I've achieved my power. Now I go do the thing. But as you said... It is very difficult to challenge them. So one of the, the the main thing I do is I make the stories less about what can you do? Because the answer is you can do kind of anything, especially if you've yeah. got a wizard. It's literally anything. But it becomes what should you do? And when we were doing Theogony at Kairos, which is my first stream uh, that had level zero characters that were blessed by the gods to become level 20. So they just got their powers. Uh, I told them right out of the gates. I'm like, look, you guys literally can do things like summon tidal waves and wipe away whole kingdoms like that's within your your purview. But understand, if you do that, some other stuff's going to happen. You know, they're. Allied nations are going to send their army against you. And even if you got 2,000 people that you could meteor swarm, and you can, you know, 10,000 archers come at you. Statistically speaking, 2,000 of them are going to crit and you're going to die. You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> so understand this. And, and the way I put it into practical effect for them was we spent three or four episodes setting the stage of the world they were in. And I knew I had to do that because if it was just level one, you've got powers. Now there's the high school bully. You're like, awesome. Disintegrate. So I had to spend some time painting who these people were and, and, and why they were the way they were, because that was the only way it was going to mean anything when I put them in peril. And the thing that happened was a goblin invasion, which again, goblins who's scared of goblins. Well, when you're level zero, goblins are really lethal. And this is one of the things I point out to people that at level 20, it's actually pretty hard to get killed at level 20. It's really easy to get killed at level one. A goblin with an ax that crits has put you away and you don't have a lot of hit points and you don't have a lot of options. So they ended up getting captured by the goblins and they were like down in the Warrens imprisoned. And that was when the gods came to them and that was when they got their power. So they're of course like just going crazy in the, in the Warrens, destroying things left and right, whole things on fire. They're feeling really great and confident. You know, I got four attacks per round now. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. And I, they kick in one of the doors and it's the nursery. All these little baby goblins in here. What are you going to do? You know, are they innately evil or are you going to spare them? Oh, okay. You're going to spare them. Well, you just killed all their parents and now their home's on fire. So, you know, <laughs> like stuff like that. You know, if are you just going to fireball them? And had they fireballed them, I would have let them, you know, because some people are like, well, you can't. I'm like, well, they can. I mean, they can, you know, <laughs> but you got to see where it goes. And what's the, what's the story that you're trying to tell? But stuff like that, you know, stuff like that, you know whose side are we really on? You know, should we intervene? Are we going to intervene? What does that intervention look like? If we kill the dragon, was the dragon the one thing keeping the giants at bay? You know, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Always a bigger fish. Always. Until the biggest (laughs) of fish that is Tiamat, my girl. (laughs) Yeah. Can't wait to pull that one out. Here's some more awesome sponsors of the show. 
My Sound Delve is a player-centric sound effect app that improves immersion. What does your character sound like? Match their actions with more than 2,000 sound effects in the My Sound Delve app. If the standard library doesn't have what you need, you can record and import unlimited sound files with the premium version. Go to mysounddelve.com to get started. Are you hungry for fortune and glory? Then follow the clues to the tomb of Hagamoth. Join the hunt for a treasure great enough to tempt even the most jaded adventurer. Dire Destiny Books presents an adventure for 4-6 to six characters starting at level 3 and ending at level 9, with entertaining monsters, traps, and unique treasures for you to encounter across a dozen thrilling locations. Available on DMs Guild from Dire Destiny Books, and the adventure continues at DireDestiny.com. Now let's get back to the show. All right. So you've been part of numerous TTRPG projects, and mm. I'm sure you have a ton more on the horizon, but mm. what project has been the one you've been most proud of so far, and what makes it really special to you? You know what's funny? There's been a lot of things that I've been really proud of, and a lot of times those things didn't necessarily get the biggest audiences, which is always a tragedy. Mm. I think the finest thing I've created was our Wraith, the Oblivion game that we did on Q Times. Uh, that I think I think we did six episodes of Wraith because I, I did all the stories in the world of darkness, vampire, werewolf, changeling, Wraith, and mage. So the so the way Wraith works is you're a ghost, like a ghost ghost, and you have something that is called the shadow, and the shadow is everything you don't like about yourself, everything you're insecure about, everything you ever did wrong, everything you're not proud of. The shadow is not your evil twin. Your shadow is you. And the way you represent this is another player at the table plays your shadow. Mm. So everyone is, I'm playing my character and someone else's shadow. And just the things they said to each other as the shadows, I was like, oh my God, that's incredible. Like they, they said things I never would have even thought of, much less said. Like, they dove in so much into just rinsing each other over the in that game. And it was amazing and heartbreaking and just cathartic. It was just one of the like most intense and fulfilling things I've ever been a part of. So I think Wraith, Wraith was number one. So much so we did Changeling right after Wraith because the world of darkness only ever gets so bright hence a world of darkness. But we were like, we need the lightest thing we can possibly do. Like, how far can this pendulum swing when we did Changeling next? Yeah, so the Wraith, the Wraith series we did on Q Times would be number one. Um, and of course, you know, Black Dice Society, what we're doing right now, very proud of. What are some of the best pieces of advice you've gotten from other talented players and GMs and DMs that you've played with over the past few years? You know, a lot of big names. I'm not going to list them all because it would take way too long. Basically everybody. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. What, what's some of the best advice you've gotten from other people you've played with? You know, believe it or not, for the most part, like we don't, we don't sit around swapping advice about stuff for the most part. So the things yeah. I have learned, I learn from people's example. Like, for instance, uh, something Jason Carl does that was very useful and I've adapted in my own games is a little bit of a, of a, of a player briefing ahead of time. He gives way more detail than, than I will. But at least you let people know. You don't spoil it for him, but you're like, check this out. You know, this week, uh, or I will tell you specifically how I do with the Black Dice Society. I'll mm -hmm. say things like, hey, this week is probably not going to be very fighty. If you have any character moments you want to have, do that now, because next week's kind of going to be a meat grinder. You know, make sure everybody's rowing in the same direction. You know, things like uh, do go to the mall, don't go to the ocean. You know, somebody's going to come talk to you. Let them say what they have to say before you decide if you're going to attack them or not. Just some context of you know what it is that is going to happen here and what, what we're going to try and do uh brennan lee mulligan uh the thing i appreciate most about brennan outside the fact he's incredible is he really puts his money where his mouth is like the reason why i met him was when they were first they were doing the first season of unsleeping city uh it, which is like a mo like a modern fantasy new york uh yeah. he was he was very 
concerned that, you know, he wanted to make sure that he got like his portrayals of like urban orcs correct. So I met him because he was asking for help with this and we talked it through and everything and it was all good. But I was just like, I just appreciate the fact that you even tried, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like good yeah. on you, mate, you know? Yeah, he did a great job of representing lots of different groups in that whole series. It was really incredible to to listen to and to watch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, he, yeah. he's 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 excellent. Yeah, I mean, most of the time I find when I'm dealing with people, I'm usually just just soaking in their freaking talent and just how just how good they are, you know, because even when I'm on set, when I'm not talking, I'm a viewer, too. You know, so I'm just like yeah. en enjoying what what what's happening, basically. One of your recent projects is Into the Motherlands, which is mm -hmm. a live stream and an actual play podcast mm -hmm. uh, that you and a bunch of other really talented, incredible POC creators have built from the ground up. So, mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about the genesis of Into the Motherlands, including designing the game, the world building, you know, and and what it was like to help record the first season of that show. Well, the Kickstarter just funded, uh, and so yeah. the, the the game development is in full speed, like in real time. Like I I, I describe the development of the Motherlands, like that Wallace and Gromit gif when Wallace was when Gromit's on the front of the train laying the tracks <laughs> down as as the train's rolling. Um, yeah, Tanya to pass, which again, putting your money where your mouth is. Like she's always looking to hook up people and use her influence and resources to really help people and move people along. And underrepresented, uh, uh, you know, members of underrepresented communities. She'd been in talks with Twitch about doing a thing. Twitch finally came back and they were like, we want something totally original. Uh, we need X number of hours by the end of the year. Here's the budget. Here's the ask, blah, blah, blah. And she knew she wanted it to be science fiction, not fantasy, because she already does so much D&D. &D. So she comes to me and she's like, Twitch wants to do a thing. And I'm like, oh, dope. Uh, well, let's just pull up the old calendar here. And it was like, well, we got to be done. I think at that time we were like by, by the second week in December, because everybody's got holidays on the brain. Back up X number of episodes. So we really need to be in production here. And by the time we crunched it out, I think we had six weeks to finish the game. We might have had four. It was nothing. It was nothing. <laughs> and so we're like, oh, okay. Create something all new in like a month. Dope. Great. Fine. You know, the first thing we hit on was we wanted to do a story about a world with no colonialism where, you know, what, what would happen if that hadn't happened to, you know, large communities and populations of, of you know minorities kicked around a couple of ideas and all of them kind of wouldn't work. Like we were like it, one of the first ideas was like, well, what if all the black people right now just left and went into space? It's like it's too late. We take that stuff with us, you know, so <laughs> working our way backwards to like, where could we do this? And I'm a little bit of a history buff. And I was aware of Mansa Munsa, who was a real person, is an Ethiopian in, uh, emperor, who had yeah. sent a, a fleet to the New World, you know, almost a thousand years ago. And, you know, historically, the, the official historical record is the fleet just never arrived. I personally believe they did arrive, and that gave rise to the Olmec culture. But that's neither here nor there. I was like, what if these people, for reasons you know, as of yet revealed in the game, but that I know were transported from Earth to another place, you know, Bermuda triangled away. And then 2000 years have happened after that. So these people are in this place, in this community, you know, interacting with these alien races and flourishing on their own. What does that look like? And that was kind of the guiding principle of the game. It's a really cool premise, by the way. When I was listening to the first episode, they were kind of going through the story. I was like, oh, this is so cool and so original and so different. And you came up with that in less than six weeks. So, oh, yeah, man, it was amazing. Uh, yeah, Eugenio really laid that out beautifully. And, and you did. know, what, once we kind of had the story, then it was, well, we got to figure out the mechanics. We knew we didn't have time to create something from scratch right then. I knew I knew fandom was spinning up Cortex, so I kind of went to them because I had some friends over there that I was like, hey, look, you guys need some press and we need a system. So that happened pretty fast. And then I, for the characters, it, it basically was like once we had the cast, I was just like, what do you guys want? Like I came up with a bunch of just playable things. And some other people did, did too, of course. And we just kind of gave them the list and it literally was like a sentence, like this will be able to do this. You know what I mean? You're like Jedi, space wizard. You know, they fight with laser swords and protect people. Like it literally was just a line. Mm -hmm. And they picked out some stuff and 
for some of them, we created all new things too. Cause I was like, what would you even want? What would your dream role be? And I will make it like, uh, when Abria joined the cast, like I created the engineer from scratch for her that I was like, what just seems dope? What would you like to be able to do? And, you know, let me put it in this framework. And even now as we're working on the book, as the writers have come on, I've just asked them, I'm like, what, what did, you know, I want you to create the story that eight year old you needed. You know, what, what was the character or situation that you needed to be able to look up to or the world you could dream and get lost in? And that's been the, the, the guiding principle. And, you know, we, we built it because, you know, obviously some problematic elements of D&D getting resolved is very public. Uh, I've, I've been able to help work with some of that. You know, my, my career exists in large part over my, my initial criticisms of Chult. To Watsi's eternal credit, they listened. Um, you shout out to Greg Tito. And, you know, brought in people like me and like Tanya and a bunch of others that have consulted and contributed to, to products since then. But one of the things that we wanted to do with this game is like there is no attribute system. Your character is defined by skills and values. What mm -hmm. are you good at and what's important to you? You know, those are defining things. If you're physically stronger, it's because you've put skill into becoming physically stronger, not that you were born as X thing. You know, even though there are different cultures, including non-human cultures, they're not defined by this race is innately smarter or this race is innately good or evil because any correlation between race and morality is problematic because nine times out of 10, the evil races tend to be dark. You know, the, the, the physically stronger, dimmer witted races tend to be of color and the smart, wise, good, fair races all tend to be lily white, you know? So yep. we kind of wanted to turn that convention on its head. And just things like, you know, the, the development of the hyenal, which are a hyena species, they look like hyena people, are the philosophers and the engineers. We wanted the ones that look the most monstrous or the most civilized. You know, we, we took every opportunity we could to try and turn those conventions on their head and kind of subtly challenge assumptions, you know, because maybe just maybe a little bit of that might roll over into the real world. And like I said, I think that you and the team did an incredible job of creating a vibrant, lush, real feeling world that, that was totally original. And I'm amazed that it was in such a short time. So congrats to you and, and the rest of the team. That's impressive. Uh, I actually talked to Cam Banks. He was one of my guests uh, previously, one of the lead designers on Cortex. And mm -hmm. I asked him about, you know, Into the Motherland specifically. And he was very quick to praise you all about your creativity with the system. And, you know, so that was also really cool, too, just to see how you kind of cobbled this from different pieces together. Cam was very instrumental because I'd go off and disappear down the rabbit hole and make a thing and then come out and be like, <laughs> Cam, does this thing work? And sometimes it'd be like, yes, but a lot of times it was like, well, that needs to be this and move this here and then it'll work. And I'm like, hey, yeah, yeah, so that Camp, couldn't Camp's have done awesome. it without him. You mentioned the Kickstarter. You earn more than seven times the goal from pledges. What does that tell you about the TTRPG community at large that, you know, the Kickstarter was so successful and that there's so much good energy behind the project? We already would have wanted to deliver the best thing we possibly could if four people had backed it. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing we were going to have the resources and opportunity to do whatever we wanted was good. You know, like we very much got to the point very quickly in the process that it stopped being about what, what's the max we can create here and became more about being like, well, let's not overdo it. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it cause if we're, if we're conscious of this and we do a good job and we're good stewards over these resources and the community we've built. This could help help us do two or three or five books, you know? So what's, mm -hmm. what is the, the, the nicest product that we can possibly deliver has been the thing. And it's given us the opportunity to be able to get the, the writers we want, the artists we want. You know, the sky's the limit. We're, we're developing this. Is, it's, we're still talking to some people, but it is almost certainly going to be an all new, unique system. It was liberating to know that people enjoyed what we created enough and have enough hope in it to be able to see more and you know sky's the limit i'm really looking forward to seeing the creation and the you know the finished product it is a a fantastic thing and uh we are very blessed and lucky to get to do it what advice do you have for budding ttrpg creators who are looking to break into the industry start forming relationships 
now. Twitter has made that very easy to do. Uh, and I don't mean this in a predatory sense of just blindly DMing people and asking them to read their your stuff because they won't. I mean, start commenting on people's posts, participating in communities, you know, meeting people. Because with anything creative, the best thing you can do is partner with people that are at the same stage in the game that you are and come up together. Like I write for film and television and make movies and the people that I work with all the time I've known since college and we all came up together. And I know lots of people that is the same, the same, the exact same thing. I highly encourage everybody to start streaming, get your friends together, turn on a camera, make sure you have a good mic and just start making content. Uh, you're going to suck at it. Everybody does at the beginning, try and get better, you know, but become a student of the craft, pay attention to how people do things, but understand, you know, they talk about the Matt Mercer effect. Pe people look at Mercer, they look at me, Brennan, Jasmine, Bular, and they're like, I can't do what they do. I can't do what Abria does. And I'm like, guess what? You can't. You really can't. You really cannot do what I do, but we can't do what you do. We can't tell your stories. We can't come up with the narratives and the visions and the adventures that you want to take people on. Only you can. So do it. You know, <laughs> like, don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Worry about what you're doing. And if you look at it from a tactical perspective, in the sense that I really like it how this person does this, I like it how this person does this, I like it how this person does this, you can grab bits and pieces of that and integrate it and make your own style out of it like bruce lee said take what is useful reject what is useless add what is specifically your own you know yeah that's it do you have any other parting words of wisdom or encouragement to new or aspiring dms and gms out there again do it it's it's yeah. you know it seems overwhelming it really isn't like anything else it is a skill that takes some time to acquire and then it takes some time to build to a high degree and don't just assume because other people have been doing it for years and years and years that they're good at it literally the worst dm i know the worst dm i know i have to be i have to be careful about this because people know exactly who i mean <laughs> i'll just say has been has been playing non-stop since first edition has you know played with Gary Gygax regularly and they are awful. So don't, uh, don't assume, man. Don't assume again. Abria has been doing this less than two years. So meteoric rise. Yeah. Yeah, man. Just get in there and yeah. do your thing. And, but again, don't measure yourself based on that. Just measure yourself. Uh, the only thing you got to worry about in, in the, the purpose of a DM, what you exist as and how you should measure success is to elicit an emotional reaction in your players. That's it. If they're happy, if they're sad, if they're laughing, if they're crying, if they're terrified, you're doing your job. Your only enemy is meh. You know, if they're zoning out, if they're on their phone, you're within your right to ban phones at the table for the record. And if somebody's like disconnecting and zoning out, the way you get them right back in is just look at them. You're like, what's your character doing? Or bring them into the storytelling. You walk into a room and it's terrible. Tell me what it looks like. And let them help tell the story along with you. Then it's collaborative. Then everybody is doing this thing together, which is good. But if you get into streaming, your duty is, yeah, you still have to tell a, a good story, but make sure that the cast is having a good time. Because if the cast is having a good time, the audience is having a good time. Yeah, so your, your duty is always to them and the story and the adventure that you're going to take together. Yeah, you can tell when casts are not having a good time. In the on the converse, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> there's been there's been more than once I have to tell myself I'm like remember to smile, remember to smile, smile and nod, smile and nod. You know, on the inside, I'm just like, what is happening? What is this? Yeah. So I intimately familiar <laughs> with that feel. Yeah. <laughs> One very last thing: if you're new, like new, like new, new, new. I mean, let's be honest. If you're listening to this, you've probably done it once or twice. But if you're new, 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 my highest advice is uh, run a module. Run run something like Curse of Strahd, run Rise of the Ruined Lords, you know, one of the ones that is going to hold your hand and take you all the way through it. That is one of the, the easiest ways to get into it. And you're guaranteed to have, or semi-guaranteed at least, to have a fulfilling experience for you and the players. Uh, yeah, that's good advice. And I think it's a great point that, they, they already wrote the story for you. And if your players are mostly cooperative, then you'll get to the end and it'll be a good payoff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's the part where you rattle off all the projects you're working on and where people can find you online and that kind of thing. 
Oh, y'all, I'm, I, I don't expect you to try and keep up with all the things I do. I barely can, and I'm there for all of it. Just follow me at B. Dave Walters on the Tweetograms. Uh, I talk about everything there. Currently, Heroes of the Plains, Tuesday nights at 6, uh, the all-time specific, on uh, Demi Plane okay. Twitch. Wednesday at 11 a.m., Champions of Lore on CNE Twitch. Thursday, Black Dice Society, which is our Ravenloft campaign on the official D&D Twitch and YouTube Vampire the Masquerade is coming back soon. Uh, we've already shot it. The date announcement is coming out soon. I don't think it's been made yet, so I don't want to mess that up. But very soon, night will fall again uh, in Sunday for the Gax Pack on the Gary Con Twitch. I'm sure I forgot about something because there's all sorts of things sprinkled all, all in there all along the way. So, yeah, just follow me on the Tweetograms at BD Walters. Also, my DMs are open. So if you have any questions or you don't know how to handle this or a quandary or need advice on anything, hit me up. I will help you. Don't come ask me anything silly. I will rinse you. But, I mean, if you, uh, I mean, start and smoke. Not like it's a stupid question. If you don't know, you don't know. There are no stupid questions. I mean, Y'all know what I mean. Y'all been on the internet. Yeah. So <laughs> <hit me up. laughs> it's true. This is how this is how this happened is just slide into those old DMs. So thanks a lot for coming on, V Dave. Been a pleasure as uh as always. I've only talked to you once. Been a pleasure. You know, but hey, but technically, technically, that's a hundred percent success rate. That, that's that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm one for one with B Dave Walters one yesterday. For one. Woo! Yeah. Thank you for having me. And the sky's the limit, y'all. Thanks for listening to How Not to DM. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, or Podchaser. I'll shout out any new reviews as they come in. My intro and outro music is by my good friend Torin, aka Mr. Tape. Check out his stuff on Spotify or Apple Music. The ad music was provided by Arcane Anthems from his collection of free RPG music. That's it for today. Until next time, roll some Nat 20s for me.